The 2006 Timbleton Research Lectures at Vanderbilt University feature Professor Rodney Stark, Distinguished Senior Fellow at Baylor University. Dr. Stark will be presenting his four-part lecture series, Neglect and Dedication, The Dynamics of Ancient Religious Markets. Part two in the series is entitled Subsidized Religions, 6,000 Years of Negligence and Laxity. Good evening and welcome. I'm James Hudnut Boimler, Dean of Vanderbilt Divinity School. The Divinity School is one of the two schools that serve as the institutional partners uh, that sponsor, on behalf of Vanderbilt University, the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture. And so it is on behalf of uh, the schools, the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture, and Vanderbilt University that I welcome you here tonight. Uh, I believe you've chosen well. You could have uh, gone to the big baseball game, but instead you've come to hear big ideas. Uh, just a few words about the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture for those of you who are uh, new uh, to this endeavor. It is a uh, interdisciplinary and interschool effort involving uh, the study of religion and other matters uh, that, that occur when religion goes public. Religion and economy, religion and uh, uh, science, religion and uh, violence, religion and uh, ecology are some of the uh, various groups that have involved now over, uh, let's see, what are we up to? 80 affiliated faculty from this university on these five major interdisciplinary research projects. One of those projects, uh, uh, this religion and science uh, and, and scale in, in science project has brought us uh, these Templeton lectures and the grant that supports uh, tonight's lecture. I think that the uh, importance of studying religion and culture in our time is almost self-evident, uh, but it is doubly important that leading research universities uh, take account of that, uh, of that social fact of human life that will not go away. Uh, no matter how much modern universities uh, might have wished it away, uh, religion is here to stay, sometimes with a vengeance. Tonight we're going to hear uh, a broad sweep of years and uh, uh, generalizations uh, and specificities that make us think. We invite you to the other uh, lectures in this series on March 14th and 28th. But now to introduce our speaker, let me introduce one of the co-directors of the Center for Study of Religion and Culture, Doug Knight. Thank you, Dean Hudnut Boimler. It's especially nice to have uh, the initial welcome made by someone who is on your steering committee, and we can hear publicly um, what he thinks of us. Appreciate your comments. Uh, I want also to acknowledge uh, my colleagues in the center. Uh, Volney Gay, Professor Volney Gay, is a co-director along with me, and also Dr. Mark Justad is our executive director. The Templeton Research Lectures uh, is, is one example, a concrete example, of the outreach that uh, we have been making with this uh, Center for the Study of Religion and Culture. Uh, one of our groups on religion and science was successful in proposing to the Templeton Research Foundation and the Metanexus Institute uh, that we organize these public lectures, one series each year, over several years now. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, we will be looking forward to uh, other lectures coming up in the next couple of years as well. We're delighted to have Professor Rodney Stark as our first Templeton lecturer. 
Professor Stark is a university professor of the social sciences at Baylor University and also a distinguished senior fellow at the Center for Religious Inquiry across the disciplines. Uh, prior to joining Baylor, he served on the faculty of the University of Washington for some 30 years. Professor Stark is a sociologist of religion, has a remarkable range of interests extending over the past 6,000 years and over the entire globe. As a scholar, he has advanced the sociological study of religion as much as any other in our generation. He also takes on massive projects. Uh, at present, he is overseeing a comprehensive, comprehensive inventory of religious beliefs and practices, not only in this country, but also now, it has just been announced, it being announced, also in the People's Republic of China. It will be a first. In addition, uh, he can also be considered one of that remarkable breed known as public intellectuals. Someone who masters his field so well that he can not only make original contributions to it, but can also explain the subject to the larger public. No easy task. In the process we can see, uh, as we will see in this lecture, he does not shy away from making claims and expressing judgments on controversial topics. It's no surprise, then, that he has been nominated for the coveted Pulitzer Prize. He seems to publish a new book every year. There are a total of 27 of them so far. They're reviewed in national publications like the, like the New York Times, have been translated into languages like Chinese, Japanese, Indonesian, Turkish, and the European languages. Among them is the widely used textbook simply titled Sociology, now in its 10th edition. You'll be interested to hear that the lectures he's presenting to us in this series uh, are already slated to appear next year in a book titled Discovering God, A New Look at the Origins of the Great Religions. This is the second of his series of four lectures. The final two will take place in March on the 14th and the 18th, the first of them on the topic of Judaism, and then the final one on Christianity. Today we will hear him discuss the topic of, Christ of religious competition and Roman piety. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rodney Stark. Well, it's really bright, isn't it? Somehow, when you get introductions like that, you know, you're moved in various ways. But I always think about Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer sitting in the balcony of the church at their funeral service. Uh, thank you. <laughs> what I want to do is, continuing from last time, is to demonstrate the very positive religious effects of pluralism by contrasting the relatively unregulated religious economy of ancient Rome with the ones I talked about last time, that is to say the monopolized religious economies of Sumer, Egypt, and Greece. Last time around, I tried to show that most ancient civilizations sustained subsidized temple religions that had no need for popular support and consequently so ignored the religiousness of the people that they even excluded them from the temples, or at least, in some instances, from entering the part of the temple where you could see the idol. One might say, in fact, that the attitude of these subsidized priests was the public be damned, and quite literally so. Salvation, to the extent they believed in any, was for the elite alone. Now, in contrast, when you have a religious economy that permits competition, there will be a multitude of religious bodies appealing to the spectrum of religious tastes, and because each religious group must gather its own support, they have to aim to attract adherents, not to exclude them. And the net result of this, of course, will be higher levels of general religiousness in the society. That's the model we're working with. Now let's go to Rome. 
Now, the earliest Roman kings also built and subsidized state temples, as had all these other ancient civilizations. But in 509 BC, the Romans threw out their king, elected a senate, and nothing was ever the same again. As the empire began to expand, new, many new gods came to Rome, but very few came at any public expense. The Senate built very few temples. Roman religion depended almost entirely on private initiative, not only by the rich, but also sometimes even poor people gathered their funds together and built a temple. Most of the temples, however, were built by military commanders as a result of vows they had made prior to a victory. And the building costs were normally met by the booty and the profits of the campaign. And some others, of course, were built by, by various foreign groups as they came to live in Rome and brought their gods with them. A telling aspect of the absence of a subsidized state religion in Rome can be seen in the priesthood. The Roman temples were not, even their traditional temples, were not served by professional full-time priests. Of course, priests showed up to conduct festivals and, and various rituals, but most of the time, the Roman temples seemed to have been served only by a few caretakers who lacked any religious duties or authority. People went to the temple, but there were no real priests there. Except for a very small number of priests who advised the Senate and did various kinds of divination, everybody else who was a priest was a part-timer. They did it for the status involved. Julius Caesar even got himself elected Pontifex Maximus in 69 or 63 BC. Uh, he had no particular interest in the temple, but it was good politics. They may, some of these priests, have received some training for their duties, but it could only have been minor compared to the priesthoods in all of these professional state-subsidized temples elsewhere. The Roman priests being amateurs, of course, and serving the temple only part-time, it means the temples never became a power base run by priests and never played any sig really significant role in the internal politics of Rome. Now, what the Romans did, however, was they took pride in being an open city. Lots and lots of people came to Rome and were relatively welcome. Many of them in the early days, of course, being Greeks, because the Greek city-states had set up cities and colonies all over the Italian peninsula prior to the rise of Rome. And as Rome expanded, of course, it incorporated all of this. And eventually, uh, Romans became so taken with Greek culture that they not only brought in and adopted a lot of Greek gods, but they started taking their own gods and giving them Greek names and, and assuming that they, in fact, were the, the same as the Greek gods. But that's not all. Lots of new gods came from Egypt and from the Near East. Rome also gave birth to a variety of new religious movements, including Mithraism. And, of course, in the end, it had long and transforming encounters with Judaism and Christianity. All of this, unfortunately, as it often does, proved to be quite a volatile mix. And one of the problems was that the traditional state, not state, but the traditional gods and their temples weren't very competitive. Now, a question is easily raised as you see all of these gods and all of these temples. Why do new faiths continue to arrive? Why do they just keep pouring in, particularly from Egypt and the East? And why were the newcomers so vigorous in comparison with the people who were already there? A well, hundred years ago, a Belgian historian named Franz Cumont suggested three major reasons. He said, the new faiths gave greater satisfaction. Why? 
because they appealed strongly to the senses, having a, fi a far higher content of emotionalism, especially in their worship activities. Secondly, Eastern faiths appeal directly to the individual rather than to the community, linking faith to conscience and to the individual rather than to the community. Third, they satisfied the intellect. They possessed written scriptures and presented a more potent and a more virtuous portrait of the gods. To this, I've added two more. My additions are that they were far more appealing to women, some offering them the opportunity to lead. And finally, the new religions were not content merely to function as temples to which people went from time to time, but organized their adherents into structured and very active communities, congregations, if you will, places where you could lead a quite rewarding spiritual life. Now let's, let's examine each of these five features in a little bit more detail. The traditional re religions of Rome mainly involve tepid civic ceremonies and periodic feasts. They sought to enlist the traditional gods to provide protection and prosperity, both for the individual and the community. And this involved public rites conducted by priests and involved a little bit, nothing much more than some chanting, uh, some passes, some, some magic, and a sacrifice. Even worship in the traditional temples for people devoted to a particular deity amounted to little bit, little more than occasional sacrifice of an animal followed by a banquet. Inspiring the early church father Clement of Alexandria to remark, I believe sacrifices were invented by men to be a pretext for eating meat. In any event, traditional Greco-Roman religions relegated religious emotionalism to the periphery of religious life. In contrast, the new, the new faiths, well, Actually, some of them we could almost call holy rollers. They had a lot of celebration, a lot of joy, a lot of ecstasy, a lot of passion, a lot of flutes, a lot of horns, a lot of singing, a lot of dancing. As for ecstasy, some of the descriptions that we have from that time make it sound very much like modern Pentecostalism. People going into trance-like states and speaking in unknown tongues. Writing in the second century, the, vi the, vi the position, I, I have a tooth on the end of my tongue here, but uh, Arteus of Cappadocia described worshipers of Sybil as entering a, a, a state of ecstatic madness. Quote, this divine madness is a possession. And when the end of the possession or the state of madness comes, the people are in good spirits, free of sorrow, as if consecrated by an initiation to the god. So Kumant summed up, the new religions touched every chord of sensibility and satisfied the thirst for emotion that the austere Roman creed had been unable to reach. But as already noted, the emotion, the emotion most lacking in Roman religion wasn't about ecstasy, it wasn't about dancing, it wasn't about singing. Roman gods had many shortcomings, but the greatest importance was that they were neither loving nor lovable. The traditional Roman image of a god, like those held in Greece and Sumer and Egypt, was basically a human being who for various reasons happened to have immortality and could do a few supernatural things. These guys were very fallible, often lacking in any morals or manners. They were afflicted with jealousy, greed, pride, lust. 
They usually had little or no interest in humans or human affairs. So long as they were properly and adequately propitiated, they really didn't care. So even in times of dire crisis, Roman efforts to enlist divine aid involved remarkably impersonal rites. In contrast, her devotees often, often addressed Isis, the goddess Isis, in deeply emotional and loving ways. And Christians, of course, emphasize their joy at knowing Christ. Now let's turn to the whole business of individualism and conscience and virtue. The traditional gods of Rome were primarily gods of the state, not of the individual. As did the temple religions of Sumer, Egypt, and the other civilizations, traditional Roman religion pursued salvation not for the individual, but for the city or the state. Aside from requiring humans to venerate them properly, the Greco-Roman gods seemed to care very little about human behavior, moral or immoral. That is to say, moral offenses were not treated as offenses against the gods. It isn't that Rome didn't have moral codes. It's that these codes were not rooted and justified on religious grounds. Worse than that, the gods set horrible examples. They lied, they stole, they raped, they adultered, they betrayed, they tortured. In contrast, the new religions arriving in Rome were not devoted to sanctifying civic affairs, but were instead directed towards the individual spiritual life. They stressed individual morality, offering various means of atonement. It was not primarily cities that would be punished or saved. Individuals could wash away the impurities of the soul. Now, some paths to atonement were built into the initiation rites of many of these new religions, which stretched purification, the washing away of guilt. Many, many various forms of baptism were practiced. In addition, formal acts of confession were practiced by followers of both Isis and Sybil. No such practices existed in the temple faiths. Nor was atonement achieved through rites alone. Many of these new faiths required acts of self-denial and privation, sometimes even physical suffering. Actions that gave credibility to doctrines of individual forgiveness because they made the individual exercise the means to be atoned. Now, sophistication. Remarkably, for a society abundant in historians and written philosophies, the traditional Roman religions had no scriptures. In contrast, the new faiths were all of them religions of the book. Not only Judaism and Christianity, but Bacchanalian, Sibylline, Isaac, and Mithraic religions offered extensive written scriptures that, as Kumon put it, captivated the cultured mind. Moreover, these new faiths presented a far more rational portrait of the gods. Even many worshipers of Sibyl, Isis, Bacchus, and Mithras recognized no other deity but their god. They didn't claim that theirs was the only god, but they regarded theirs as the supreme god, and this was the only one they patronized. As Kumon summarized, the new religions acted upon the senses, the intellect, and the conscience at the same time, and therefore gained a hold on the entire person. Compared with ancient creeds, they appeared to offer greater beauty of ritual, greater truth of doctrine, and a far greater morality. The worship of the Roman gods was a civic duty, the worship of the foreign gods an expression of personal belief. But Kumat failed to consider two additional factors. The first is gender. The situation of Roman women was abysmal, worse than in many contemporary societies of the same time. They were married off very early in their teens, usually to far, far older men. 20, 30-year age differences were taken for granted. 
13-year-old girl, 40-year-old man. They had no legal rights except as the ward of their spouse or their father or a male relative. And the wives of the wealthy were kept in virtual seclusion as if they were living in a harem. As for religion, although women were permitted to attend most religious occasions, they had little opportunity to take any active part in the religious life. There were some priestesses in various traditional temples, but only in those dedicated to a goddess. Worse yet, priestesses were subject to severe regulations quite unlike anything imposed on priests. Vestal virgins were buried alive for transgressions. In contrast, many of the new religions offered women substantial opportunities, as well as far greater security and status within the family. For these reasons, Roman women flocked into Christianity when it became available. But this trend began much earlier in the other new religions. Consider the cult of Bacchus that developed in Rome several centuries before Christianity arrived, which seems to have had a very strong appeal to women. What this group may actually have done to bring about its vicious repression by the Senate we'll talk about in a minute. But among its alleged sins was that both men and women held leadership positions. Either male or female leadership would have been permitted by Roman norms, but not both. Roman authorities were also deeply offended by the gender outlook and practices that accompanied the arrival of temples dedicated to the great female deities as Magna Mater or Sibyl and Isis. Both drew enthusiastic female followings, although they were also popular with men, and both sexes held priestly positions. Nor was diasporan Judaism wanting in this respect. Not too well known, but beyond the reach of the patriarchs in Israel, Jewish women in this time and in this place held leadership roles in many synagogues, having titles of elder, leader of the synagogue, mother of the synagogue, presiding officer. We know all of these things from inscriptions that have been dug up when they've dug up synagogues. But it wasn't only a matter of having scriptures and moral concerns of singing or speaking in tongues or even equitable sex roles that gave the new religions their edge. Above all else was their capacity to mobilize a lay following by involving people in congregations, in active communities of believers. Traditional Roman religions offered as I've noticed, very little in the way of community. The typical thing was to get together every few months for a sacrifice and dinner, and nothing more in between times. But the new religions expected their followers to worship daily on their own and to gather for services weekly or even more often. Sheer frequency, let alone the intensity of these gatherings, made these religious groups central to the lives of their adherents. This was something that had not previously existed. At least until the middle of the Republic, there was no sign in Rome of any specifically religious groups. People did not see themselves as members of something religious. The Greco-Roman gods had only clients and festivals, not members and services. The new religions then offered this whole great sense of community, a much stronger kind of membership. Although not as exclusive or as well tied together as Judaism and Christianity, initiates into Bacchanalianism, Mithraism, Sibylline worship were expected to cease temple hopping and devote themselves fully to their respective deity. They made their religious group the focus of their social life. 
this is where their friends were. This is where the people they related to were. It's like modern congregations. If you look around in America, we, think, we see churches that are growing, and they all have intense community life, and churches that are slumping away, and they, instead of con congregations, they have audiences. Audiences don't compete well with communities. But it was precisely these religious groups that were set apart and that were so strongly bound together that scared the Roman elite. They not only opposed these groups, the Romans were so paranoid at the top that they opposed all voluntary groups as a potential source of dissent, conspiracy. The first century, edicts were issued regulating the formation of all private gatherings. Sounds like Hitler or Stalin. Under Augustus, a more extensive law of associations was passed which required that all associations be authorized by the Senate or the Emperor. And this permission was almost never granted. Consider this. Pliny the Younger, he's out in Nicomedia. He decides, since the city had almost burned down, sitting in the ashes, he writes to the Emperor Trajan and said, can we let the folks out here form a volunteer fire department? It seems pretty obvious thing. The Emperor wrote back, no. It is societies like these which have been responsible for political disturbances. If people assemble for a common purpose, the emperor writes, whatever name we give them, and for whatever reason, they soon turn into a political club. So from time to time, the Roman state pers persecuted many religious groups, not only Christians and Jews, but the pagan congregations too. Now, there's very little evidence of any religious conflict going on in these societies that had the subsidized state temples. But that's for lack of opportunity. It was pretty hard to get anything off the ground in these places. Uh, consider that when Plato designed his ideal state, he re recommended that anyone who did not conform to the official religion should be executed. I mean, that's putting it pretty clearly. Uh, things were far different in Rome. They had all of these gods coming in. And by the way, some of their more unbelieving intellectuals uh, wrote parodies on all of this sort of thing in which the gods are very concerned about running short of ambrosia and nectar because their numbers were key, key continued to increase and, you know, while it was, wasn't global warning, warming, but it was running out of resources. But the real hostility was reserved not for new gods, but for congregations, any congregations. Let's consider the Bacchanalians. Everybody knows who the Bacchanalians were. They were a bunch of people committed to drunken orgies, right? Well, we believe that that's because what the Roman historian Livy claimed about the group when the Senate ferociously suppressed this cult of Bacchus in 186 BCE. These charges were probably false. Because in addition to Livy's account, we have the Senate's decree when it outlawed them. And what does it say? Well, first of all, they prohibited their shrines. But the group itself wasn't outlawed. It was only limited as to size and the functions of its gatherings. They could no longer meet in groups larger than five. They could not hold funds in common. They could not swear oaths of mutual obligations. They were prohibited from celebrating rites in secret. And men were not permitted to be priests. And that's it. That's all that the Senate did. Nothing was said about not getting drunk or having group sex or human sacrifice or any of these things. So what was their crime? Upon attracting converts, 
the Bakayans surrounded them with a very intense group life. Where rather than meeting several times a year and eating an ox, they basically met weekly. Now, in order to do that without disrupting their affairs, they held their meetings at night in temples they had built for that purpose. To become a member required initiation into the group's mysteries and the swearing of solemn oaths of devotion and loyalty. They were not casual participants in, in, in occasional feasts. They were closely united into intense, very self-conscious congregations. And that's what aroused the Senate against them. No doubt there were also rumors about lurid activities. We can, we can count on that because there were similar rumors of lurid activities about every religious group that came along, including the Jews and the Christians. Those weren't true, and probably none of them ever was true. But what the Senate actually did was suppress the congregational features of the group its regular meetings, and its organizational structure. This story was repeated when the goddess Isis came to, from Egypt. She, too, inspired congregations. Her followers set themselves apart and gathered regularly. They didn't disparage the gods of the temples, but they didn't attend them either. This did not escape attention. In 58 BCE, the Senate outlawed Isis and ordered her altars and statues torn down. They repeated the ban ten years later, and Roman councils around the empire responded by destroying all Isaiah temples as disgusting and pointless superstitions. Next, they were vigorously repressed by Augustus. See, they don't go away. They just keep hanging on. And Tiberius had the Isaiah temple in Rome destroyed and had all the priests crucified still didn't go away. It was Calig Caligula, hardly a paragon of virtue, who had a taste for the exotic, and he first allowed a temple to Isis to be built on the camp campus Martius. It was not until the reign of Carcella early in the third century that an Isaiah temple was allowed on the capital. Still, Isis was so attractive that she soon had more, almost three times as many temples in Rome as any other god or goddess. And what about Roman anti-Semitism? For some reason, I cannot understand, there are any number of recent scholars, so-called, who claim that Christians invented anti-Semitism. Nonsense. If so, then many of Rome's leading intellectuals must have been Christians. And they must have been Christians long before the birth of Jesus. It was the great Roman philosopher Seneca who denounced the Jews as an accursed race and condemned their influence. It was Cicero who complained that Jewish rites and observances were at variance with the glory of our empire and the dignity of our name. It was the esteemed Tacitus who railed against the Jews because they despised the gods and who called their religious practices sinister and revolting. Not only that, according to Tacitus, the Jews had enriched themselves by their very wickedness, and they seek increasing wealth through their stubborn loyalty to one another. But the rest of the world they confront with hatred reserved for enemies. How does this stuff differ from anything that was going on in Europe in the late 19th or early 20th century? It's a standard anti-Semitism, and it's quite pre-Christian. And it wasn't only a matter of words. The Jews were expelled from Rome in 139 BCE and charged that they had been attempting to introduce their own rights to the Romans and to infect Roman morals. In 19 CE, the Emperor Tiberius ordered the Jews in Rome to burn all their religious vestments and assigned all Jewish males of military age to serve in Tar Sardinia, where it was hoped the weather would kill them. In addition, all other Jews were banished not only from the city, but from Italy, on pain of slavery for life if they did not obey. 
In 70 CE, the emperor Vespasian imposed a special tax on all Jews in the empire, thereby impounding the contributions that had been made annually to the temple in Jerusalem. In 95 CE, the emperor Domitian had his cousin Flavius Clemens and many others executed for having drifted into Jewish ways. Now, no doubt many Romans did resent that the Jews dismissed their gods as illusions and their temples as blasphemous. But that's not really the great sin here. The standard sin was to be a strong, well-organized, separated community, which was consistent with the fact that the periodic persecutions of the Jews were not different from those of the Bacchanalians, the followers of Isis, and a number of other similar groups. By the time Christianity presented Rome with intense, active, set-apart congregations of the support of the sort sustained by all these other groups, the repressive response was entirely predictable. What the Romans preferred, or what their officials preferred, not what the people preferred, because they joined these things, what the Roman officials preferred were easygoing gods whose clients were content to gather from time to time for a banquet. And so it came to pass in the year 64 that scores of Christians died as human torches, crucified and set on fire in Nero's garden. And thereafter it was illegal to be a Christian, but the prohibition was only enforced from time to time, and then only here and there, and for two centuries all persecution was local. By the time the first empire-wide persecution began, Christianity was already getting too big to easily be suppressed. It was too long, it was too late. They were no longer a little sect. Not only that, they were probably at the two to three percent of the population, but they were all clustered in the big cities where their impact was much, much greater and, of course, much more obvious. More. Nor were they recruiting the slaves and the poor. I don't want to justify that tonight. I've written chapters on it, but the point of the fact that it, like almost every other religious movement, recruited from the elite. The first Christians were heavily over-recruited from among the privileged, which also made their growth more visible and more significant. The Christians were too numerous, too well-connected, and too committed to be easily suppressed, especially since the Romans made a dreadful mistake. They thought that since their temple religions were organized from the top down, they could destroy Christianity just by taking the bishops and killing them. And there's nobody left to lead, the thing would disappear. But Christianity in those days, like many other groups, was a bottom-up organization. For every bishop they killed, there were 20 guys waiting to be bishop. And nothing really ever happened. In the end, of course, the traditional temples proved incapable of holding their own in this free market. The sketches, however, seem to me I'm going to turn a little bit aside here for a minute. They offer a needed rebuttal to several centuries of unfounded and disingenuous claims about the inherent tolerance of paganism. Gibbon probably started this when he wrote about the mild spirit of antiquity in contrast with the narrow and unsocial spirit and sullen obstinacy of the Jews and the intolerant zeal of Christianity. Similar claims about tolerant pagans and intolerant Christians and Jews have been made again and again and again. Very recently, Jonathan Kirsch explained, nowhere in the ancient world was open-mindedness of paganism more apparent than in Rome. He continued regretting the failure of the Emperor Julian to undo Constantine's boost of Christianity and restore the empire to paganism. It is tantalizing to consider, he wrote, how close Julian came to bringing the spirit of respect and tolerance back into Roman government and thus back into the roots of Western civilization 
and even more tantalizing to consider how different our benighted world might be if he had succeeded. And all I can say is, who in the world was it who threw the Christians to the lions, who crucified priests of ISIS and executed converts to Judaism? Must have been a bunch of Greeks sneak in there and do that. Huh? Who knows? Now, to bring it all to the end. The assumption here is when you get all these religious groups competing for adherence, that the consequence is the average level of religiousness in your society rises. We already know that in the old temple societies, uh, uh, the people were kind of on their own religiously. It was pretty tepid stuff because they weren't even allowed to go into the temple to see the gods. So, I'm predicting, of course, in retrospect, that the Rome, average Roman was more religious than the average people in Mesopotamia and Sumer and Greece and Egypt and whatnot. And unfortunately, we don't have any opinion polls. And we can't even go by the religiousness of the elite because what we're talking about is the religiousness of ordinary people. And ordinary people are very invisible when we go back this far in history. Perhaps an obvious indication, however, comes from a strange fact which also led to the two great persecutions of Christians, is that as Rome's fortunes went downhill, two different emperors hit on the same solution, which was, if we can only get the old gods of Rome to come back and support us, that's our problem, the gods have deserted us. And so what did they do? They thought it was important to have everyone, everyone in the empire, take part in a revival campaign. So they ordered each and every citizen to perform a sacrifice to the gods in front of magistrates who then issued them a certificate to prove that they had complied. And you needed one of those in case you had to show it. You know, uh, It's amazing we have tons and tons of these certificates which have survived. Now, no Sumerian king or Egyptian pharaoh would ever even thought of such a thing. Why get the public involved? They don't count for anything. It seems to me that this inclusive policy of the emperors reflected a different religious outlook in which it was not enough that priests conducted the appropriate rituals, but the, the extent of participation mattered too that for society as a whole to deserve divine aid, everyone should have participated in the sacrifices. And of course, when the Christians didn't, that led to all sorts of bad things, but we don't need to talk about that now. There is a second reason to suppose that Rome was more religious, and that's because outsiders, particularly Greek intellectuals, wrote on it again and again and again. They wouldn't believe how religious people were in Rome. Of course, another possible proof of this is the success of these movements themselves. These new religions did come and attract large followings. And almost the arithmetic you know, was almost unavoidable. That must have created higher levels of religiousness in the society than in societies where these movements were not out there competing for followers. But of course, that edges on circularity that I'm trying to say that all of this competition created higher religiousness. But the fact of the matter is, these movements could have failed. They could have gone out there and tried to round up followers and not gotten any. The fact that they got so many, and in the long run so many millions of them, seems to me important. There also are some fragments of hard evidence. We know from inscriptions a lot about donors who built various temples and did this, that, and the other thing. And an early study of these kinds of inscriptions found that 16% contributing to uh, these, these groups like ISIS and Sybil and what are called Oriental cults and so on. 16% of the donors to Oriental cults in Rome were made by freedmen or slaves. That seems like a substantial representation from people who really didn't have much of anything. Nothing comparable is known about any other ancient society. 
Now, that evidence isn't abundant, but it's all we've got. And it all points in the same direction. Now, finally, as I said last time, the reason I do any of this is because I'm interested in theories. And the problem we have in social science is that all our theories are based on data that are about 15 minutes old and were collected in Nashville or, or uh, Waco or some other American place. And the theories that I'm interested in, I would like to, to hope that they would have general kind of application. So we need to test them in far away and remote settings. I wish I had a wonderful public opinion poll from 9th century China. I'd love that. Well, this is part of my effort to do some of that, is looking in some of these odd places. In doing it, it seems to me, there's a, not only you know, testing, the, it seems to me there's an important specific finding that comes out nevertheless, and that is that the common basis for repression and persecution, not just of the Jews and the Christians, but of all of these new religions, reveals a pattern that's much more interesting than saying, well, they were down on the Christians. Didn't like the Jews much either. No, this was a generic thing. They went after group after group after group, enormously different. Many of these people had no difficulty uh, sacrificing to the Roman gods, for example. They didn't break those rules, but they got persecuted anyway. What they had in common was high levels of commitment the closely knit religious congregations. That's what upset the Romans, or at least the ruling Roman elite, because the people who were upsetting them, of course, were also Romans. And, of course, they became truly frightened when one of these intense little groups got bigger and bigger and bigger, and when they persecuted them and nothing happened, and they got bigger and they persecuted them again, and they got bigger, and pretty soon they were so big, they took over Rome. Of course, I'm talking about the rise of Christianity, which I'm going to talk about in my fourth lecture. Meanwhile, two weeks from now, I'm going to come back and talk about the role of pluralism in the triumph of monotheism among the ancient Hebrews. That's a reach. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Starr. Uh, he has agreed to uh, receive uh, questions. So we have on either side a microphone, and I'd like to uh, invite anyone who is interested in uh, asking him something about the lecture uh, to go to the microphone. You can be heard better that way. Uh, while we're waiting for someone to get there, uh, let me start with the first question. Um, you talked at the very beginning about the role of the individual a person, the persons in Rome who uh, decided uh, to uh, to uh, turn in a different direction religiously, and uh, as women as well as men, especially. But it's uh, but and then in the latter uh, the several points that followed, you seem to emphasize more groups. Or how do you bring both of these together, especially in terms of your market sure. analysis? Um. <clears throat> There's a certain sense in which groups don't really exist. I mean, uh, groups that don't have individuals in them aren't there. And groups really only do anything as a bunch of people who share this common identity actually do something. You know, I mean, corporations don't do anything. People in corporations do things. And, and it's convenient for us to characterize this in these group terms. We always remember the individual. But something else. Individuals only do things as they have options. And in this instance, uh, you know, why didn't the people in Sumer turn away and, and join uh, a congregation? Because there weren't any. And the reason that I stress the supply side aspect, if you will, of religious life is I think that the basic demand for religion is pretty constant from one time and one place to another. What varies in terms of the extent to which that demand is expressed has to do with the suppliers. If they're vigorous and working hard at getting followers, then 
lots and lots and lots of people respond and find an outlet for their religious feelings and indeed generate a lot of religious feelings. And when there's nobody out there appealing to them, uh, shutting them out, in fact, like I think even a lot of American denominations have recently started to do, but what happens if people don't go to those churches? Now, in a society like ours, you go, they go to a different church. But in a society where there's only one, they don't go to any church. And, and that's why I, I think the whole thing does fit together pretty, pretty easily. Thank you. We have, we have a question. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Thank you for the lecture. Is this on? Yeah. Thanks for the informative lecture. You, you stressed with some emphasis at the end that the Christian religion got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually, I think you said, took over Rome. So I'm curious about that statement. Um, do we know how many Christians actually existed in Rome at the time of Constantine? And could you speak on the expedient decision of Constantine to embrace Christianity as the state religion as compared with this bigger and bigger and bigger, finally taking over Rome theory. I'll deal with this a lot in my fourth lecture, but the answer is I think I know how many Christians there were in Rome uh, from about the year uh, 40, or in the world as a matter of fact, from about the year 40 through about the year 350. Um, I've done a lot of interesting little projections, um, just basically fooling around with uh, growth rates of known groups and whatnot. But the thing that, that, that recently came home to roost for me was my little projection that I've been using for 10 years. Some guy had a bunch of data on Christian names in Roman graveyards. And he was nice enough to give them to me. And taking the two curves, my, my estimated curve and the, uh, the graveyard curve, um, the correlation was 0 0.987. I mean, the, the, the two lines just lie on top of each other. So I'm getting pretty comfortable with, with the projection. Um, my guess is that there are about 15% of the empire, but they would be almost all urban, so it would be much higher in the cities, were Christians at the time Constantine comes along. And I don't think Constantine made the church. I think the church made Constantine. I think Constantine was smart enough to appeal to this untouched big Christian population uh, to back him against other people for, for the throne. Um, I think in the long run he probably ruined Christianity, uh, because it, he started making it a subsidized state religion. And the first thing you know, instead of people being called into the ministry, you have all these rich kids running in because that's where all the big money and power was. And the next thing, as I'm going to say in my fourth lecture, they stopped going out and missionizing. It's not clear that Northern Europe ever was converted. I mean, I, I can say that because my ancestors all came from Northern Europe, and it's not clear... How converted they ever were, you know. There, there's stuff in the Icelandic Landa book that says, Thor was a Christian most of the time except in matters of seamanship in which he prayed to Thor. Uh. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if not, uh, we want to thank you very much uh, for talking this evening. We look forward to two more sessions uh, on the 14th and the 28th of March. Uh, as I said earlier, we'll be moving next to uh, Judaism, after that to Christianity. Let me say also that uh, for those of you who are not on our mailing list, we invite you to stop at the back uh, table there and uh, give us your email or your uh, street address. So we would love to be able to uh, communicate with you about upcoming events, especially a chance to see uh, Professor Stark again in two weeks. Thank you so much. This has been a production of the Center for the Study of Religion and Culture at Vanderbilt University and Nashville Public Television.